Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the Iron Cage, the story of the Palestinian struggle for statehood by Professor Rashid Khalidi. Professor Khalidi is the Edward Said Chair for Arab Studies at Columbia University, and he's written a very fine book, which I find myself struggling to cover in just one video. So I'm going to do something I haven't done before is I'm dividing the, this review into two parts, part one and two, and I'm, I'm using a 1948 division between the book. The book doesn't necessarily use this division. There are six different chapters in the book that do mostly go in chronological order, but I think for purposes of this review and how much I want to cover, this part one is going to be up to 1948, just before 1948, and the second part of this video, which will come out right away at the same around the same time, I'm going to be talking about 1948 to, to present day ish because the book was published in 2006 just about the time that israel was pulling out of gaza unilaterally and so present day for this book is 2006 but we can fill in some blanks there but i'll talk about that in part two in part one we need to go back in history a bit and go back to the mandate so when we think about the mandate uh the british mandate of palestine we don't often realize there were other mandated states in the area who use that exact terminology so if you read that um, when we think about Palestine, we have to think about it in relation to Jordan, to Syria, to Lebanon, to Iraq, to Egypt. These were other mandatory states in which the majority population eventually ruled themselves. Palestine thus represented a striking anomaly among the Class A League of Nations mandates. These territories were all former parts of the Ottoman Empire that had been provisionally recognized in 1919 by Article 4 of the League's Covenant as independent states, deemed to be in need solely of a period of external advice and assistance until they could take their place as full-fledged members of the international system. So as far as the UN was concerned at this time, the League of Nations, the predecessor, this was going to be countries that would come into existence not countries that would stay colonies of Britain and France. So the Palestinians have this impression that we are going to be like these other countries that are around us in some way or another. That was not the plan of the British. That was not the plan of the Zionists. They were very clear on their plans. The Palestinians seem to have not realized what was going on around them, or they took ineffective means. And when Professor Khalidi is asked, why did you write this book? He says, I wanted to show that the Palestinians have not only been victims, but they've had agency. They've had opportunities to make decisions, and sometimes they've not made the right decisions or whatever, however you want to judge those decisions. They need to be given agency. They need to be said to have made a decision and, and to look at that for what it's worth. So Palestinians had their expectations. The British had their own. And they, their, their job was largely to ignore uh, the Palestinians in, in the governing documents even. So um, the fact that the League of Nations mandate for Palestine constituting the entire legal basis for the British regime erected in the country, and which was never modified until the demise of the League with the outbreak of World War II, explicitly refrained from mentioning either the Palestinians as a people or their national self-determination. By contrast, the Jewish minority of the population was so recognized. While the mandate's 28 articles included nine on antiquities, not one related to the Palestinian people per se. They were variously and vaguely defined as a, quote, section of the population, quote, natives, or, quote, peoples and communities. As far as Great Britain and the League of Nations were concerned, they were definitely not a people. The Palestinians were never once cited by name, whether as Palestinians or as Arabs, and we were referred to only as non-Jewish communities. So you have to understand that the British were crystal clear on what they were trying to do. They were trying to establish a Palestinian homeland. Uh, sorry, Palestinian homeland. They were trying to establish a Jewish homeland, and the Palestinians didn't have a place there. Uh, here's another quote, which deserves to be better known, as Professor Khalidi says. This is a 1919 memo from Foreign Secretary Balfour, the Balfour Declaration. Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes, of far greater import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. 
I mean, is this a joke? They, they actually said this. So the Jews are important. Palestinian is not so important. The Arabs not so important. What's important is Jewish hopes, not the quote desires and prejudices of the Arabs. So they wanted to hold this position. Here's another quote. They were the British. They were committed to holding fast to such a position, at least until immigration brought about a Jewish majority, at which stage it would become a moot point and perhaps democracy could be admitted because then the uh, Zionist would uh, have a majority. So the Palestinians had an idea of what they thought was going to happen. They thought that they were going to get their own state as the other states around them uh, came into existence. The British knew what they were doing, which is definitely ignoring the Palestinians, not letting them uh, to de- uh, not letting them develop. And wow, the Zionists, the Zionists really knew what they were doing. And a lot of credit to them in the sense of Israel does not come about accidentally. Israel comes about by planning, by intentionality, by thoughtfulness, and uh, they were is advised as such by the British. Here, in the 1920s, Zionist leaders expected and were given to believe confidentially by many of their official British interlocutors that the entire country of Palestine would and should eventually become a Jewish state, even though they generally confined themselves in public to the ambiguous term Jewish national home. In their public statements, these leaders give little attention to the formal place to be given to the Arabs in the Palestine-Israel of the future, except perhaps as a tolerated minority after Jews had eventually become a majority in the country as a result of unrestricted immigration. Um, To quote uh, Ze'ev Jabotinsky, who is uh, a well-known violent Zionist, there is no choice. The Arabs must make room for the Jews in Eretz Israel. If it was possible to transfer the Baltic peoples, it is also possible to move the Palestinian Arabs. Move, transfer, it's all the same thing, ethnic cleansing. And ethnic cleansing doesn't only mean murdering people, it can, but ethnic cleansing can mean moving people, even moving them nonviolently, just pushing them away. Uh, or uh, what we saw, uh, we, we'll talk about in, in our next uh, in next part of this, uh, this review. So, The Zionists were clear they were buying land and they were buying land from absentee Arab or Palestinian landlords who didn't really realize what was going on around them. And those Jewish landlords, new Jewish landlords would then kick off the Arab peasants who'd been working the land for centuries. These people were now landless. They didn't have anywhere to go. And even though they'd been living there a long time and, and the the Zionists insisted on Hebrew labor. So they didn't, they, not only did these people lose a home, they lost a job at the same time. So they're wondering now there's, there's this problem and they have a Jewish agency, which is recognized by the league of nations. And it's some, let's say a predecessor of a state. So the Zionists, because not only uh, they have British backing in the mandate, but they have a lot of organization. They basically are getting ready to create a state. The Palestinians, in the meantime, are particularly what Khalidi talks about as the notables, we could use the term elites, were going hat in hand to the British and appealing to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, right of self-determination, majority rule, and were being ignored. Uh, Then they themselves are divided. There's not a Palestinian National Congress. This is forbidden by the British. They don't allow any sort of elections or organization. Uh, Khalidi points out, could the Palestinians have done something on their own? Certainly, but they were divided. The British had uh, elected somebody called the Grand Mufti, which hadn't previously existed in the Ottoman system in the way that it did, in which it was a, had a superior place, and then used the divide and, and rule strategy of having families compete for each other, uh, compete for, let's say, dominance, uh, leadership among the Palestinians. But all during this time period of the mandate, the Palestinians don't have a clear leader that for the whole nation, and they don't have an organized resistance to what the British are imposing. So that gets us to 1936, where we have a strike, the, one of the largest strikes ever, in, in the spirit of what we would see with the Congress party in India many years later, but a real strike, which unfortunately had some bad effects for them economically as well, which then went on to a three-year uprising, which was brutally crushed by the British. So what you're seeing is Palestinian discontent with the status quo. This isn't something that just came out of nowhere because they they wanted to murder Israelis. What was happening was their country was take, being taken from them by unrestricted immigration. 
the the um, the Zionists were bringing as many settlers as possible so that they could constitute a significant number, so that they could make an argument for for taking taking over the the land. These people were being dispossessed. The British were complicit in it, and what we have prior to 1948 is a, a lot of restlessness and and problems that led to this outbreak. And that 1936 to 1939 outbreak, Khalidi concludes, is really the end for the Palestinians as in terms of creating a state, because by the time we get to 1948, the Zionists have advanced even further. They have militias that have been trained well. Their political structures are even further advanced. They've uh, been making friends in many capitals around the world. So they're, the Zionists are prepared to take the state of Israel into existence. The Palestinians are still waiting around for the British to give them the time of day, and they don't. And how we're going to end today's part part one of this review is how we how we get to the civil war in Palestine that happened in 1947, which is the United Nations voted. <laughs> so it was here in the bitter end game of the Palestine mandate that the Palestinians suffered the most from their previous failure to establish a recognized representative national body. They were unable to defend their society in the civil war that erupted as soon as the United Nations General Assembly voted for the partition of Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state in Resolution 181, passed on November 29, 1947. Even before that, they were either not consulted or were effectively ignored by the various international efforts that culminated in this resolution. So what happened to the Palestinians was the United Nations voted, and at least, again, I referred to this in a previous video, I refer to the United Nations mandate because that a, that points out that there should be two states, that it can't just be one state and occupying a bunch of other people. But the fact that it got to this point and got to this point by 1947, where some external people are saying there will be a Jewish and a Palestinian state and you Palestinians, you don't have anything to say about it. This is where we start to cross over from agency, I would say, into victimhood. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next video. Um, as, as always, if you'd like to support this work, please hit like, please hit subscribe, please consider uh, buying this book from the links below. There's also books on my wish list. There's plenty of books I'd like to review in the future. You can pick one from the wish list, ha have it sent to me. I might be able to review it. And uh, you can also support the work on Patreon or become a YouTube member and uh, be able to give input into these videos and give some ideas for directions that I can go. Um, it'll be a very short time until next time because part two is coming right up, but until that time, enjoy your reading.